You are listening to Miniature Masterpiece. Chapter 1, Mr. Lockwood's Diary Yesterday, I arrived at Thresh Cross Grange, a beautiful estate located on the edge of the moors, as a tenant of Mr. Heathcliff, the owner of the neighboring property known as Wuthering Heights. I was eager to explore the surrounding countryside. However, upon my arrival, I was informed by the housekeeper, Mrs. Dean, that Mr. Heathcliff was an unsociable and mysterious man who preferred to keep to himself. In fact, Mrs. Dean warned me against visiting Wuthering Heights, stating that it was not a place for civilized people. Despite her warning, I was intrigued by the idea of exploring the desolate and wild landscape of the moors, and so I set out for Wuthering Heights the next day. Upon my arrival, I was met with a dark and unwelcoming atmosphere. The house itself was in a state of disrepair, with broken windows and doors hanging off their hinges. The interior was no better, with dusty and neglected furnishings and an overall feeling of neglect. As I waited for Mr. Heathcliff to greet me, I noticed a young man and woman, who I later learned were Hareton Earnshaw and Catherine Heathcliff, quarreling in the corner of the room. Their conversation was heated and passionate, filled with accusations and insults. Suddenly, a strange and imposing figure appeared in the doorway. Mr. Heathcliff was tall and thin with a weathered and unapproachable demeanor. His presence filled the room with an aura of danger and unpredictability. Despite his unwelcoming manner, Mr. Heathcliff begrudgingly allowed me to stay for dinner, during which I observed the strange dynamics of the household. It was clear that there was tension and an ease between the inhabitants of Wuthering Heights, but the reasons for this remained a mystery to me. As I left Wuthering Heights that night, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease and dread. The events of the evening had left me with more questions than answers, and I knew that I would have to return to Wuthering Heights to unravel the mysteries that lay within its walls. Thus, my journey into the strange and unsettling world of Wuthering Heights had begun, and I could only hope that I would survive the journey unscathed. Chapter 2 The Estate of Thrush Cross Grange as I awoke the next morning, I was greeted by the tranquil beauty of Thrush Cross Grange. The estate was a stark contrast to the wild and desolate landscape of Wuthering Heights, and I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief and comfort. The interior of the house was just as beautiful as the exterior, with polished floors and elegant furnishings. The room I had been given was cozy and inviting, with a large window that offered a view of the moors. As I began to explore the grounds of the estate, I was struck by the abundance of nature and the peacefulness of the surroundings. It was as if the beauty of the estate was a haven from the harshness of the outside world. As the days went by, I settled into a routine at Thrush Cross Grange. I spent my mornings exploring the surrounding countryside and my afternoons reading in the comfort of the house. However, Despite the idyllic nature of my surroundings, I couldn't shake the memory of Wuthering Heights from my mind. The strange and unsettling atmosphere of the house and its inhabitants had left a lasting impression on me, and I couldn't help but feel drawn back to its mysteries. One day, I received a surprise visit from a stranger. The man, who introduced himself as Mr. Lockwood, had been my predecessor as tenant of Wuthering Heights. He warned me against visiting the house, stating that it was a place of darkness and evil. Despite his warning, I felt compelled to return to Wuthering Heights. I was drawn to the mystery and intrigue of the place, and I knew that I needed to uncover the secrets that lay hidden within its walls. As I made my way back to Wuthering Heights, I was struck by the stark contrast between the estate and its neighboring property. While Thrush Cross Grange was a place of beauty and elegance, Wuthering Heights was a place of darkness and despair. Upon my arrival, I was greeted by the same and welcoming atmosphere as before. Mr. Heathcliff was as unapproachable as ever, and the inhabitants of the house seemed to be caught in a constant state of tension and conflict. Despite this, I persisted in my efforts to uncover the secrets of Wuthering Heights. As I spent more time at the house, I began to uncover the dark history of its inhabitants. 
It became clear to me that the source of the tension and conflict within the house was the twisted and complex relationships between the inhabitants. Love, jealousy, and revenge had all played a role in shaping the lives of the people of Wuthering Heights. As I left Wuthering Heights that day, I couldn't help but feel a sense of sadness and despair. The beauty and elegance of Fresh Cross Grange seemed to be a distant memory, replaced by the darkness and pain of Wuthering Heights. Thus, I found myself caught in a world of contradictions and complexities, torn between the beauty and peace of Fresh Cross Grange and the mystery and darkness of Wuthering Heights. Chapter 3 The Arrival of Heathcliff the arrival of Heathcliff was a turning point in the history of Wuthering Heights. Mr. Earnshaw, the owner of the estate, had returned from a trip to Liverpool with a young orphan boy in tow. The boy, who was named Heathcliff, was of unknown origin, and his appearance was a source of speculation and gossip among the people of the nearby village. Some claimed that he was the son of a gypsy, while others believed him to be a demon in human form. Despite the rumors surrounding his origins, Heathcliff quickly became a part of the Earnshaw household. He and Catherine, Mr. Earnshaw's daughter, formed a deep and intense bond, spending their days roaming the moors and exploring the surrounding countryside. However, not everyone was pleased with Heathcliff's arrival. Hindley, Mr. Earnshaw's son, resented the boy's presence, viewing him as a threat to his position as heir to the estate. As Mr. Inshaw's health began to decline, the tensions within the household reached a boiling point. Hindley's hatred for Heathcliff had grown to the point where he refused to acknowledge him as a member of the family. With Mr. Inshaw's death, the situation at Wuthering Heights only grew worse. Hindley became the master of the estate, and he treated Heathcliff as a servant, subjecting him to physical and emotional abuse. Despite the abuse, Heathcliff remained fiercely loyal to Catherine, and their bond only grew stronger with time. However, their relationship was not without its complications. Catherine's social status made it impossible for her to marry Heathcliff, and she was forced to choose between her love for him and her desire for social acceptance. In the end, Catherine chose to marry Edgar Linton, a wealthy and respectable gentleman. This decision marked the beginning of a series of tragic events that would shape the future of Wuthering Heights. Heathcliff, consumed by his love for Catherine, became bitter and vengeful. His desire for revenge on those who had wronged him led him down a dark and dangerous path. The arrival of Heathcliff at Wuthering Heights marked a turning point in the lives of its inhabitants. His presence brought both love and destruction to the people of the estate and his story serves as a cautionary tale of the power of love and the dangers of revenge. Chapter 4 The Meeting of Catherine and Heathcliff The meeting of Catherine and Heathcliff was a moment that would shape the course of their lives forever. From the moment they met, there was an undeniable chemistry between them, a connection that went beyond words. Heathcliff, who had arrived at Wuthering Heights as a young orphan boy, was immediately drawn to Catherine's wild and independent spirit. Catherine, for her part, was intrigued by Heathcliff's mysterious origins and brooding intensity. Their friendship quickly blossomed into something more, as they spent their days exploring the moors and dreaming of a future together. However, their relationship was not without its complications. Catherine's social status and Heathcliff's unknown origins made it impossible for them to marry. This fact weighed heavily on both of them, as they struggled to reconcile their love for each other with the harsh realities of their situation. Despite these challenges, Catherine and Heathcliff's love only grew stronger with time. They shared a bond that transcended the physical, a connection that went beyond the confines of their social status and the expectations of society. However, their relationship was not without its challenges. The arrival of Edgar Linton a wealthy and respectable gentleman, complicated matters. Catherine found herself torn between her love for Heathcliff and her desire for social acceptance. In the end, Catherine chose to marry Edgar, a decision that would have far-reaching consequences for all those involved. Her marriage to Edgar marked the beginning of a series of tragic events that would shape the future of Wuthering Heights. Despite the pain and heartache that followed, 
Catherine and Heathcliff's love remained constant. Their connection was as strong as ever, and even in death, they were unable to escape the pull of their love for each other. The meeting of Catherine and Heathcliff was a moment that would change the course of their lives forever. It marked the beginning of a love story that would endure through the ages, a tale of passion and tragedy that serves as a testament to the power of love and the enduring nature of the human spirit. Chapter 5 The Death of Mr. Inshaw The death of Mr. Inshaw was a turning point in the history of Wuthering Heights. The patriarch of the household, Mr. Earnshaw had been a strong and loving presence in the lives of his children, Catherine and Hindley, and his adopted son, Heathcliff. With his parsing, however, the delicate balance of the household was upset. Hindley, who had always resented Heathcliff's presence in the household, became even more hostile towards him, seeing him as a threat to his position as heir to the estate. Heathcliff, for his part, was consumed by grief at the loss of his beloved father figure. He became withdrawn and distant, retreating into himself and losing his once bright spirit. The death of Mr. Earnshaw also marked the beginning of a series of tragic events that would shape the future of Wuthering Heights. Hindley's resentment towards Heathcliff only grew stronger with time, leading to a series of physical and emotional abuses that left Heathcliff broken and traumatized. Despite the hardships he faced, however, Heathcliff remained fiercely loyal to Catherine, and their bond only grew stronger with time. They shared a connection that was as deep and profound as it was inexplicable, a bond that transcended the physical and the rational. However, their relationship was not without its complications. Catherine's desire for social acceptance led her to marry Edgar Linton, a wealthy and respectable gentleman, despite her deep love for Heathcliff. This decision marked the beginning of a series of tragic events that would lead to the unraveling of the lives of all those involved. Heathcliff, consumed by his love for Catherine and his desire for revenge against those who had wronged him, descended into a spiral of darkness and despair that would leave him broken and bitter. The death of Mr. Earnshaw was a turning point in the history of Wuthering Heights marking the beginning of a series of tragic events that would shape the future of the estate and its inhabitants. It serves as a cautionary tale of the power of love, the dangers of revenge, and the fragile nature of the human spirit. Chapter 6 Catherine's Stay at Fresh Cross Grange Catherine's marriage to Edgar Linton brought her to a world that was unfamiliar to her. She struggled to adjust to the refined lifestyle and expectations of high society at Thresh Cross Grange, missing the wildness and freedom of her youth on the moors. Despite her love for Edgar, Catherine felt a deep connection to Heathcliff that could not be denied. She grew restless and dissatisfied with her new life, sneaking out of the house to roam the fields despite the protests of her servants and Edgar's disapproval. As Catherine's stay at Thresh Cross Grange continued, she became increasingly conflicted. While she recognized the love and devotion Edgar had shown her, she also felt a deep longing for the rugged simplicity of Wuthering Heights and the companionship of Heathcliff. This inner turmoil would eventually lead Catherine to a fateful decision. She chose to marry Edgar, believing it to be the best path to a stable and secure life. However, this decision would have far-reaching consequences for all those involved. Despite her struggles, Catherine remained fiercely loyal to Edgar, recognizing the love and devotion he had shown her. However, her longing for the wildness of her youth and the companionship of Heathcliff remained a constant presence in her thoughts. The aftermath of Catherine's marriage would bring these conflicting emotions to a head. As her health began to deteriorate, she found herself caught between her loyalty to Edgar and her love for Heathcliff. This struggle would ultimately lead to a fateful decision that would change the course of her life and the lives of all those around her. Catherine's stay at Thresh Cross Grange serves as a reminder of the complexities of love and the challenges that come with adapting to a new way of life. It is a testament to the strength and resilience of the human spirit in the face of adversity and a warning of the dangers that come with denying one's true nature. As Catherine's story unfolds, it becomes clear that her struggles are not unique. 
the desire for love and acceptance, and the struggle to reconcile conflicting emotions are universal human experiences. Catherine's story serves as a powerful reminder of the importance of staying true to oneself and the dangers that come with denying one's true nature. Chapter 7 Kathy's Return in Marriage Years after leaving Wuthering Heights, Catherine returns as a married woman. She has married Edgar Linton, a man of wealth and status, and her return is met with mixed emotions by those at the house. Hindley, her brother, is bitter and resentful towards her. He blames her for the loss of their father's affections and for the way that Heathcliff has been treated. Heathcliff himself is torn between his love for Catherine and his desire for revenge against those who have wronged him. Despite the tension and conflict, Catherine remains steadfast in her love for Edgar. She is determined to make a life with him and sees their marriage as a way to escape the darkness and wildness of Wuthering Heights. As Catherine settles into her new life with Edgar, she struggles to adjust to the refined lifestyle and expectations of high society. She misses the wildness and freedom of her youth and finds herself longing for the rugged simplicity of Wuthering Heights. Despite her struggles, Catherine remains committed to Edgar and to building a new life with him. Their marriage is marked by moments of tenderness and happiness, but also by conflict and tension. Catherine's return and marriage are a turning point in the story of Wuthering Heights. It marks the beginning of a new chapter in the lives of those at the house and sets in motion a series of events that will have far-reaching consequences. As the story unfolds, it becomes clear that the love between Catherine and Heathcliff is not easily forgotten. Their connection is deep and powerful, and it continues to haunt those at Wuthering Heights long after Catherine's marriage. Despite the challenges and conflicts that come with their new life, Catherine remains committed to Edgar and to building a new future for herself. She sees her marriage as a way to escape the darkness of her past and to find a new sense of happiness and fulfillment. However, the past has a way of catching up with us, and Catherine's return to Wuthering Heights will have consequences that she could never have imagined. Her story serves as a warning of the dangers of denying one's true nature and a testament to the enduring power of love and passion. Chapter 8 The Death of Catherine The marriage of Catherine and Edgar is not without its struggles. Despite her affection for Edgar, Catherine cannot forget her love for Heathcliff. Her feelings for Heathcliff are powerful and consuming and they continue to haunt her even in her married life. One night, as a storm rages outside, Catherine becomes gravely ill. Edgar is beside himself with worry, and he sends for the doctor. However, despite their efforts, Catherine's condition worsens, and it becomes clear that she is not going to recover. In her final moments, Catherine's thoughts turn to Heathcliff. She confesses her love for him to Nellie Dean, her trusted servant and begs her to deliver a message to him. After Catherine's death, the atmosphere at Wuthering Heights becomes even more charged. Edgar is consumed with grief and anger, blaming Heathcliff for Catherine's death. Hindley becomes even more unstable, drowning his sorrows in alcohol and gambling. Heathcliff, meanwhile, is tormented by his loss. He cannot forget Catherine, and her death drives him to the brink of madness. He becomes obsessed with the idea of being reunited with horror, even in death. As the days pass, Heathcliff's behavior becomes increasingly erratic. He begins to see visions of Catherine's ghost, and he becomes convinced that she is still with him in some form. His obsession with Catherine and his desire for revenge consume him, and he becomes more and more dangerous. The death of Catherine marks a turning point in the story of Wuthering Heights. It sets in motion a series of events that will lead to tragedy and heartbreak for all involved. Her love for Heathcliff and her marriage to Edgar serve as a reminder of the power of love and the dangers of denying one's true nature. Despite the pain and sorrow that her death brings, Catherine's legacy endures. She remains a powerful presence at Wuthering Heights, and her memory continues to haunt those who loved her. Her story serves as a testament to the enduring power of love, even in the face of tragedy and loss.
Chapter 9 Isabella's Marriage to Heathcliff After Catherine's death, Heathcliff becomes even more erratic and unpredictable. His obsession with Catherine and his desire for revenge consume him, and he becomes increasingly dangerous. Despite his behavior, Isabella Linton, Edgar's sister, falls in love with Heathcliff. She sees in him a wildness and passion that is absent in the refined society of her upbringing. She sees in him the same qualities that Catherine was drawn to, and she becomes infatuated with him. Heathcliff, on the other hand, sees in Isabella an opportunity for revenge against Edgar. He marries her out of spite and takes pleasure in the thought of causing Edgar pain. Isabella's marriage to Heathcliff is marked by violence and cruelty. Heathcliff treats her with contempt, and she is constantly afraid of him. She is trapped in a loveless marriage, and she longs for the safety and security of her former life. Despite her fear and desperation, Isabella remains loyal to her brother. She sends a letter to him, warning him of the danger that Heathcliff poses. Her letter sets in motion a series of events that will have far-reaching consequences for all involved. Isabella's marriage to Heathcliff serves as a reminder of the dangers of obsession and revenge. It also serves as a warning of the consequences of denying one's true nature. Heathcliff's marriage to Isabella is a cruel and calculated act, and it marks him as a man consumed by his own darkness. As the story unfolds, it becomes clear that Isabella's fate is tied to that of Catherine and Heathcliff. Her marriage to Heathcliff is a turning point in the story of Wuthering Heights, and it sets in motion a series of events that will lead to tragedy and heartbreak for all involved. Isabella's story serves as a warning of the dangers of allowing oneself to be consumed by obsession and revenge. It also serves as a testament to the enduring power of love and loyalty, even in the face of darkness and despair. Chapter 10 The Arrival of Linton Heathcliff After the death of Isabella, her son Linton is sent to live with his father, Heathcliff. Linton is frail and sickly, and he struggles to adjust to life at Wuthering Heights. Heathcliff, meanwhile, is consumed with his desire for revenge against Edgar and the Linton family. Heathcliff sees in Linton an opportunity to achieve his revenge. He plans to use Linton as a pawn in his game of revenge against Edgar and the Lintons. He hopes to manipulate Linton into marrying his own daughter, Catherine Linton, and thus gain control of Thrush Cross Grange. Despite his fragile health, Linton proves to be a stubborn and willful child. He resents his father's attempts to control him, and he longs for the safety and security of his former life. As the days pass, Linton's health deteriorates even further. He becomes increasingly frail and sickly, and he is constantly in need of care and attention. Heathcliff becomes even more determined to use Linton as a means of achieving his revenge, and he is willing to do whatever it takes to achieve his goal. The arrival of Linton Heathcliff marks a turning point in the story of Wuthering Heights. It sets in motion a series of events that will lead to tragedy and heartbreak for all involved. Heathcliff's obsession with revenge against the Lintons consumes him, and he becomes increasingly dangerous and unstable. Linton's story serves as a reminder of the dangers of manipulation and control. He is a pawn in Heathcliff's game of revenge, and he suffers greatly as a result. His story also serves as a warning of the consequences of denying one's true nature. Linton longs for the safety and security of his former life but he is trapped in a world of darkness and despair. As the story unfolds, it becomes clear that Linton's fate is tied to that of Catherine and Heathcliff. His arrival at Wuthering Heights sets in motion a series of events that will lead to tragedy and heartbreak for all involved. His story serves as a warning of the dangers of obsession and revenge, and it serves as a testament to the enduring power of love and loyalty, even in the face of darkness and despair. Chapter 11 The Confession of Nellie Dean As the story of Wuthering Heights unfolds, Nellie Dean emerges as a central character. She is the housekeeper at both Wuthering Heights and Thrush Cross Grange, and she is witness to many of the key events in the story. In Chapter 11, Nellie confesses to Lockwood, the narrator of the story, 
that she has played a role in the tragic events that have unfolded. She admits to having kept secrets and withheld information that could have changed the course of events. Nellie's confession serves as a reminder of the dangers of silence and secrecy. She is complicit in the tragedies that befall the characters of Wuthering Heights, and she bears a great deal of responsibility for the suffering that they endure. As Nellie tells her story, it becomes clear that she has played a key role in the lives of Catherine and Heathcliff. She was there at the beginning of their relationship, and she witnessed the events that led to Catherine's marriage to Edgar Linton. Despite her knowledge of the truth, Nellie remained silent, and she allowed events to unfold as they did. She withheld information that could have changed the course of events, and she allowed the characters of Wuthering Heights to suffer needlessly. Nellie's confession is a turning point in the story of Wuthering Heights. It marks a moment of reckoning for the characters, and it sets in motion a series of events that will lead to redemption and forgiveness. As the story unfolds, it becomes clear that Nellie's confession is a necessary step on the path to healing and reconciliation. It is a reminder of the power of truth and the dangers of silence and secrecy. In the end, Nellie's confession serves as a reminder of the enduring power of love and loyalty, even in the face of darkness and despair. It is a testament to the fact that redemption is possible, even in the most tragic of circumstances. Chapter 12 The Ghost of Catherine Earnshaw As I lay awake in my bed, I was startled by a strange sound. It was a tapping at my window, soft at first but then growing more insistent. I rose from my bed and approached the window, and there before me was the ghost of Catherine Earnshaw. Her hair was wild and tangled, her eyes ablaze with an otherworldly fire. I could not believe what I was seeing, but there she was, in the flesh or rather in the spirit. She spoke to me, and her voice was full of a fierce passion that I had never heard before. She told me of her love for Heathcliff, and of her pain at their separation. She spoke of her suffering, of the torment she had endured in life and in death. I listened to her tale, transfixed by the intensity of her words. I felt as though I were in the presence of a being from another world, one whose very existence was beyond my comprehension. As she spoke, I could feel the hairs on the back of my neck standing on end. Her words were like a cold wind blowing through my soul, and I could not help but shiver with fear and wonder. And yet, despite her fearsome appearance and her turbul tail, I felt a deep compassion for Catherine. I could see the pain and the longing in her eyes, and I knew that she was a creature of immense passion and depth. In that moment, I realized that there was much more to the world than I had ever imagined. I saw that there were mysteries beyond my understanding, secrets that lay hidden in the darkness, waiting to be revealed. And so, as Catherine faded away into the night, I knew that I had been forever changed. I had glimpsed a world that was beyond my imagining, a world that was full of wonder and terror, of beauty and horror. As I lay back down in my bed, I knew that I would never forget the ghost of Catherine Earnshaw. Her memory would haunt me always, a reminder of the fragility and the power of the human heart, and of the mysteries that lie just beyond our grasp. Chapter 13 The Return of Isabella Linton It had been some time since Isabella Linton had left Wuthering Heights, fleeing from the cruel and violent Heathcliff who had taken her as his wife. But now, to my surprise, she had returned. I saw her walking up the path towards the house, her figure bent and haggard, her hair disheveled and unkempt. She looked as though she had aged ten years since the last time I had seen her. As she drew closer, I saw the fear and the desperation in her eyes. She had come to me for help, seeking refuge from the man who had once been her husband. I could not turn her away and so I took her in and tended to her wounds. She told me of the horrors she had endured, of the abuse and the neglect that she had suffered at the hands of Heathcliff. And yet, despite her suffering, there was a fierce determination in her eyes. She refused to be broken by her ordeal, and she spoke of her plans to escape from Heathcliff's grasp once and for all. I could not help but admire her courage, 
and I vowed to do all that I could to help her in her quest for freedom. But as the days went by, I began to see the toll that Isabella's time at Wuthering Heights had taken on her. She was consumed by fear and paranoia, and she could not shake the feeling that Heathcliff was watching her, waiting to strike at any moment. And then, to my horror, I received word that Heathcliff had found her. He had come to reclaim his wife, and he would stop at nothing to get her back. I knew that I had to act quickly if I wanted to save Isabella from a fate worse than death. I made arrangements to take her away from Wuthering Heights, to a place where Heathcliff could not reach her. But even as we fled, I could feel the shadow of Heathcliff looming over us. I knew that he would stop at nothing to get what he wanted, and I feared for the safety of myself and Isabella. In the end, it was only through luck and the kindness of strangers that we were able to escape Heathcliff's grasp. Isabella and I parted ways, but the memory of her haunted me for years to come. In the return of Isabella Linton, I saw the turbulent power of love and obsession. I saw how it could twist and distort a person, turning them into something unrecognizable. And I saw the lengths to which a person would go to protect the ones they loved. It was a reminder of the fragility and the resilience of the human spirit, and of the eternal struggle between good and evil. And though Isabella's story had ended, I knew that her memory would stay with me always a testament to the depths of human passion and the strength of the human will. Chapter 14 The Arrival of Edgar Linton It was a dark and stormy night when Edgar Linton arrived at Wuthering Heights. The wind was howling outside, and the rain was coming down in sheets, beating against the windows like tiny fists. I had been sitting by the fire, lost in thought, when I heard the knock at the door. I opened it to find Edgar standing there, drenched to the bone and shivering with cold. He had come to ask for news of his sister, Isabella, who had fled from Wuthering Heights some weeks before. He had heard rumors that she was with child, and he was desperate to find her and bring her back to the safety of Thrush Cross Grange. I did not know what to tell him. Isabella had come to me for help, but I had not seen or heard from her since she had left. I could see the pain and anguish in Edgar's eyes, and I knew that he would not rest until he had found his sister. And so, I agreed to help him in his search. We rode out into the stormy night, our horses struggling against the wind and rain. We searched for hours, calling out Isabella's name, but there was no answer. The darkness swallowed us up, and the rain continued to fall, drenching us to the bone. And then, just when it seemed as though all hope was lost, we caught sight of a figure in the distance. It was Isabella, stumbling through the rain, her clothes torn and her face pale with fear. We rode to her side, and I saw the relief flood over Edgar's face. He took her in his arms, and I saw the love and the compassion in his eyes. Isabella was weak and exhausted, but we managed to get her onto a horse and we rode back to Thrush Cross Grange as quickly as we could. As we rode, I could see the love between Edgar and Isabella blossoming, despite the hardships and the dangers they had faced. It was a love born of pain and suffering, but it was a love that would endure. In the arrival of Edgar Linton, I saw the power of love to conquer all obstacles. I saw the strength and the resilience of the human spirit and I saw the lengths to which a person would go to protect the ones they loved. And I knew that, no matter what trials and tribulations lay ahead, the love between Edgar and Isabella would continue to burn bright, a beacon of hope in a dark and stormy world. For me, it was a reminder that even in the face of the greatest hardships and the darkest of nights, love will always find a way to triumph in the end. Chapter 15 The Death of Isabella Linton Isabella's health had been in decline ever since she fled from Wuthering Heights. She was weak and frail, and it seemed as though every day she grew weaker. Edgar had done all that he could to care for her, but he knew that her time was running out, and so he sent for her brother, Heathcliff, hoping that he would be able to see her before she passed away. Heathcliff arrived at Thrush Cross Grange and despite his reputation for cruelty and malice, he showed a tender side as he sat by Isabella's bedside. She was barely conscious, 
but she managed to whisper his name, and a faint smile crossed her lips. For a moment, it seemed as though she might recover, but her illness was too far advanced. She slipped away in the early hours of the morning, surrounded by Edgar and Heathcliff, who were both devastated by her loss. Heathcliff was inconsolable. He had loved Isabella with a fierce and unyielding passion, and her death was a crushing blow to him. But even in his grief, he could not forget the wrongs that had been done to him. He blamed Edgar for Isabella's death, and he swore that he would have his revenge. And so, he took his revenge in the only way he knew how. He married Isabella's sister-in-law, Linton, who was frail and sickly like Isabella had been. Heathcliff's marriage to Linton was not one of love, but rather one of vengeance. He used her as a pawn in his game of revenge, using her to torment Edgar and to gain control of Thrush Cross Grange. But despite his efforts, Heathcliff could not erase the memory of Isabella. Her death haunted him, a reminder of the pain and suffering that he had endured at the hands of those he loved. In the death of Isabella Linton, I saw the power of love and the devastation that it can wreak upon those who are left behind. I saw the pain and the suffering that can come from loving too deeply, and the destruction that can come from seeking revenge. And I saw the fragility of life, and the need to cherish each moment that we have with those we love, for we never know when our time with them may come to an end. For Isabella, her time came too soon, but her memory lived on, a reminder of the love and the loss that we all must face in our lives. Chapter 16 The Birth of Catherine Linden After the death of Isabella, the household at Thrush Cross Grange was filled with a deep sense of sadness and loss. But life goes on, and soon there was a new life to celebrate. Catherine Earnshaw Linton had been born, a beautiful and healthy baby girl who brought a sense of joy and hope to those around her. Her mother, Catherine, had died not long after her birth leaving her father, Edgar, to raise her alone. And so, he poured all of his love and devotion into his daughter, determined to give her the best life possible. As Catherine grew, she proved to be a spirited and intelligent child, with a quick wit and a sharp tongue. She was adored by her father and by her cousin, Hareton, who had become like a brother to her. But despite the love and care that Catherine received, she could not escape the shadow of her father's past. Heathcliff was still a presence in their lives, and his bitterness and hatred seemed to infect everything around him. Catherine was fascinated by Heathcliff, drawn to him by a deep and primal connection that she could not explain. She longed to know more about him, to understand the secrets that he kept hidden within himself. But Heathcliff was not interested in forming a bond with Catherine. He saw her only as a means to an end a way to gain control of Thrush Cross Grange and to exact his revenge upon those who had wronged him. And so, he plotted and schemed, using Catherine as a pawn in his game of vengeance. He arranged for her to marry his sickly and weak son, Linton, hoping to gain control of the Grange through their union. But Catherine was not easily manipulated. She was a strong and independent woman, with a will of her own and she refused to be used as a pawn in Heathcliff's twisted game. In the birth of Catherine Linton, I saw the beauty and the fragility of life. I saw the love and the devotion that can exist between a parent and a child, and the lengths that a parent will go to protect their child from harm. But I also saw the darkness that can lurk beneath the surface, the bitterness and the hatred that can poison even the purest of relationships. And I saw the power of love and determination and the strength that can be found in standing up for oneself, even in the face of overwhelming adversity. Catherine Linton was a symbol of hope and light in a world that had been consumed by darkness, and even as the forces of vengeance and hatred conspired against her, she remained strong and resilient, a beacon of hope for those around her. Chapter 17 The Flight of Heathcliff after the death of Catherine, Heathcliff's obsession with her only grew stronger. He became more isolated and unpredictable, causing great concern among those around him. Eventually, he disappeared for three years without a trace, leaving behind a sense of mystery and fear. 
Nellie Dean recounts the events leading up to his disappearance, beginning with a violent argument between Heathcliff and Isabella. In his rage, Heathcliff reveals his true feelings about Catherine, causing Isabella to flee to London and give birth to their son, Linton. Meanwhile, Heathcliff begins to plot his revenge against Hindley, who has taken control of Wuthering Heights. Heathcliff's plan involves marrying Linton to Catherine's daughter, also named Catherine, in order to gain control of both Thrush Cross Grange and Wuthering Heights. However, things do not go as planned. Linton proves to be weak and sickly, and Catherine is not interested in him. When Heathcliff's health begins to deteriorate, he becomes desperate and resorts to kidnapping Catherine and imprisoning her at Wuthering Heights. During this time, rumors begin to circulate about Heathcliff's involvement in Isabella's death and his possible connection to other dark events in the area. When Catherine finally escapes and returns to Thrush Cross Grange, she reveals that she had been tortured and manipulated by Heathcliff during her captivity. Heathcliff's disappearance follows shortly after Catherine's return. It is not clear whether he died by suicide or simply fled the area. His absence leaves behind a sense of emptiness and relief among those who knew him, but also a sense of uncertainty about what really happened during those three years. The flight of Heathcliff marks the end of an era at Wuthering Heights and Thrush Cross Grange. The darkness and instability that he brought with him dissipates with his departure, leaving behind a sense of peace and the possibility of new beginnings. Chapter 18 The Return of Heathcliff After years of absence, Heathcliff returns to Wuthering Heights, a changed man in both appearance and character. He is now wealthy and polished, with an air of refinement that is incongruous with his origins. As he enters his old home, his presence is immediately felt by those living there, causing fear and unease among them. Heathcliff's arrival causes a stir in the community, as rumors and speculation abound about where he has been and what he has been doing. Isabella, who had married Heathcliff in secret, is now living in London with their son, Linton and has cut all ties with her family. She writes to her brother Edgar, warning him of Heathcliff's return and urging him to take precautions. Heathcliff's intentions are unclear, and his behavior is often erratic and unpredictable. He seems consumed by a desire for revenge, particularly against those he perceives to have wronged him in the past, including Edgar and his family. Heathcliff also appears to have an obsession with the memory of Catherine, the woman he loved who had died years earlier. Heathcliff's presence at Wuthering Heights creates tension and conflict between himself and the other characters, particularly Edgar and his daughter, Kathy. Kathy is curious about her father's old friend and wants to learn more about him, but Heathcliff seems to hold a deep grudge against her family and is dismissive of her attempts to connect with him. As time passes, Heathcliff's behavior becomes more and more extreme causing concern among those around him. He becomes increasingly isolated and consumed by his obsession with Catherine, often speaking to her as if she were still alive. Heathcliff's health also begins to deteriorate, and it is clear that he is not long for this world. As Heathcliff nears the end of his life, his actions become more and more erratic, causing fear and anxiety among those around him. His final words are plea to Catherine asking her to haunt him for the rest of his days. Heathcliff's death marks the end of an era and the beginning of a new one for those left behind. Chapter 19 The Illness of Catherine Linton It was in the midst of summer when Catherine Linton fell gravely ill. Her delicate frame was no match for the fever that had taken hold of her, and she lay in her bed, pale and weak with only the occasional moan to indicate that she was still alive. Edgar Linton was beside himself with grief, for he loved his daughter more than anything in the world. He spent every waking moment at her side, holding her hand and trying to comfort her as best he could. But Catherine's illness seemed to have a hold on her that no amount of love or care could break. Nellie Dean, who had been with the family for many years, was tasked with looking after Catherine during her illness. Nellie was devoted to the girl, and she did everything in her power to make her comfortable. She changed her sheets and pillows, 
brought her water and broth, and even sang to her when she was too weak to sleep. But despite all of Nellie's efforts, Catherine's condition only worsened. She became delirious, tossing and turning in her bed, muttering unintelligibly under her breath. Her fever raged on, and her body was racked with pain. It was then that Edgar Linton decided to call for a doctor. He knew that it was unlikely that the doctor could do anything to cure Catherine's illness, but he hoped that perhaps he could ease her suffering in some way. The doctor arrived promptly, and he examined Catherine carefully. He shook his head gravely when he was finished, and he told Edgar that there was little he could do for her. He advised Edgar to make her as comfortable as possible and to prepare himself for the worst. Edgar was heartbroken by the doctor's words, but he refused to give up hope. He continued to hold Catherine's hand, whispering words of love and encouragement to her even as she slipped further and further away from him. Days turned into weeks, and Catherine's condition remained unchanged. She continued to suffer, and there seemed to be nothing anyone could do to ease her pain. And then one day, something miraculous happened. Catherine's fever broke, and she began to improve. Her color returned, and she was able to sit up in bed for the first time in what seemed like ages. Edgar was overjoyed by Catherine's sudden recovery, and he showered her with love and attention. He even allowed her to eat her favorite foods, despite the fact that they were not particularly good for her. But even as Catherine regained her strength, there was a sadness in her eyes that Edgar could not quite understand. She seemed to have lost something during her illness, something that he could not quite put his finger on. And then one day, when Catherine was feeling particularly strong, she confided in Nellie Dean. She told Nellie that during her illness, she had seen Heathcliff. He had come to her in a dream, and he had spoken to her in a voice that was both tender and cruel. Catherine told Nellie that Heathcliff had begged her to come to him, to join him in death. He had told her that he could not bear to be without her, and that he longed for her to be with him always. Catherine's confession shocked Nellie, for she knew how much Catherine had despised Heathcliff. But there was no denying the truth of what Catherine had said. She had seen Heathcliff, and he had spoken to her from beyond the grave. And so Catherine's illness had left her not only weakened in body, but haunted in spirit as well. She had seen the ghost of the man she had once loved and hated, and it had left her feeling more conflicted than ever before. She could not shake the memory of Heathcliff's voice, nor could she forget the love she had once felt for him. As Catherine grew stronger, she tried to push the memory of Heathcliff's ghost to the back of her mind. She focused instead on her love for her father and on the beauty of the world around her. She took long walks in the gardens of Fresh Cross Grange breathing in the sweet scent of the flowers and feeling the warm sun on her face. But even as Catherine tried to move on from her illness, she knew that she could never forget the experience she had gone through. It had changed her in ways that she could not yet fully comprehend. And so she went forward, unsure of what the future might hold. She knew that there were many challenges yet to face, but she also knew that she was strong enough to face them head on for she had survived her illness, and she had seen the ghost of a man she had once loved and hated. And in doing so, she had come to understand the complex and powerful nature of the human heart. Chapter 20 The Visit of Mr. Lockwood The winter days had grown shorter, and the chill had set deep into the bones of the inhabitants of Wuthering Heights. Mr. Lockwood after being detained in the Grange due to his illness, had finally returned to Thrush Cross Grange. His visit to Wuthering Heights had left an indelible impression on his mind. He had never witnessed such a place where the natural beauty of the moors was mawed by the ugliness of human behavior. As he sat by the fire, wrapped in blankets, he began to recount his harrowing encounter with Catherine Earnshaw's ghost. His vivid description of the ghost's appearance and demeanor sent shivers down the spine of his listeners. Even Nellie, who was usually unfazed by such stories, seemed to be affected by Mr. Lockwood's tale. As he finished his narration, Mr. Lockwood noticed that Nellie seemed lost in thought. He prodded her to tell him more about the ghost he had encountered. 
Nellie began to recount her own experience with the ghost of Catherine Earnshaw. She revealed how she had found Heathcliff kneeling by the grave of Catherine, his eyes fixed on the window of Fresh Cross Grange. Nellie's tale piqued Mr. Lockwood's curiosity about the history of Wuthering Heights and its inhabitants. He implored Nellie to share more information about the family. Nellie, who had known the Earnshaw and Lyndon families for years, was more than happy to oblige. She began by telling Mr. Lockwood about Catherine and Heathcliff's childhood, how they had been inseparable until the arrival of the Lintons. She narrated how Catherine, in her eagerness to become a lady of the manor, had married Edgar Linton, but never quite lost her love for Heathcliff. As Nellie spoke, Mr. Lockwood couldn't help but feel sorry for Catherine and Heathcliff. He realized that their love for each other had been destroyed by the societal expectations of their time. He also sensed that there was more to the story than what Nellie was telling him. He pressed her for more information, but Nellie remained silent. Mr. Lockwood knew that he wouldn't get any more information from Nellie that night. He bid her good night and retired to his room, his mind still filled with the tale of Catherine Earnshaw and Heathcliff. As he lay in bed, he thought about the ghost he had encountered at Wuthering Heights. He wondered if it was truly Catherine's ghost or if it was just a figment of his imagination. He resolved to find out more about the history of Wuthering Heights and the tragic tale of Catherine and Heathcliff. The visit of Mr. Lockwood had left an indelible impression on the inhabitants of Fresh Cross Grange. His tale of the ghost of Catherine Earnshaw had given them much to think about. Nellie, who had lived through the events of the past, was haunted by the memories of the tragedy that had befallen the Earnshaw and Linton families. As the winter nights grew colder and darker, the inhabitants of Wuthering Heights and Thrush Cross Grange continued to grapple with the weight of their shared history. The story of Catherine and Heathcliff would continue to haunt them for years to come, a testament to the power of love and the destructive forces of society. Chapter 21 The Death of Linton Heathcliff it was a dreary winter morning when Linton Heathcliff finally succumbed to his long-standing illness. He had been frail and sickly for as long as anyone could remember, a mere shadow of his father's strength and his mother's beauty. The end came quietly, without fanfare, in the early hours of the morning, with only the servants and his father to bear witness to his passing. Heathcliff was visibly affected by the loss of his son, though he did not openly show it. He grew even more reclusive, barely venturing out of the house and spending long hours alone in his study. When he did speak, it was only to issue curt orders to the servants or to bark at Herdon, who had taken to spending his evenings with the old man in an attempt to keep him company. Catherine, too, was affected by Linton's death, though she had never been particularly close to him. She mourned the loss of the love that might have been of the family that might have existed if her father had not been so stubborn and her mother so weak. She withdrew into herself, spending long hours in her room, staring out the window at the bleak winter landscape. Herdon tried to cheer her up, bringing her books and offering to take her on long walks across the moors, but she rebuffed his every attempt, telling him she needed time to grieve. As the days passed, the household settled into a grim routine. Heathcliff grew more distant, Catherine more withdrawn, and Hareton more frustrated. Only Nellie Dean, the old nurse who had been with the family for years, seemed to know how to manage the household, keeping things running smoothly despite the pervasive sadness that hung over them all. One day, as Catherine was wandering aimlessly through the house, she stumbled upon a dusty old book. It was an account of her mother's life, written by a former servant who had loved her deeply. As she read through the pages, she felt her heart fill with longing and regret. She began to see her mother in a new light, not as the weak, fragile creature her father had described, but as a woman of strength and passion who had loved deeply and suffered greatly. The more she read, the more determined she became to break free from the bleak existence that had been her lot. She began to speak to Hareton again, to share her thoughts and dreams with him and to listen to his stories of his own childhood and his hopes for the future. Slowly, but surely, Catherine began to emerge from her grief, 
to see the possibilities that lay before her. She knew that she could never have the life she wanted with her father or with Linton, but perhaps she could find it with Herdon. She began to dream of a future where they would live together, far away from the Moors, where they would build a life of their own, filled with love and laughter. As the winter began to thaw and the first signs of spring appeared, Catherine and Herton began to work together to make their dreams a reality. They spent long hours in the gardens, planning and planting, and they began to talk of marriage, of the life they would build together. For Heathcliff, the transformation in his daughter was too little, too late. He remained distant and aloof, unable or unwilling to see the beauty and potential that lay within her. And yet, as he watched Catherine and Hareton together, he could not help but feel a glimmer of hope, a sense that perhaps, after all, there was some good in the world. Upon seeing his condition, Catherine agrees to stay with Linton and tend to him. While she initially resents her duty, Catherine eventually develops a bond with Linton and grows to care for him deeply. However, their time together is cut short when Linton passes away due to his po health. Following Linton's death, Catherine is devastated and falls into a deep depression. She becomes withdrawn and isolated, refusing to leave her room or interact with anyone. Even Hareton's attempts to console her are met with hostility. As time passes, Catherine slowly begins to heal from her grief and returns to her normal activities. She spends time with Hareton, and they grow closer, eventually falling in love. Their relationship is complicated by their past, as Hareton's father, Hindley, was responsible for the mistreatment of Catherine's family years ago. Despite these obstacles, Catherine and Hareton's love for each other continues to grow. They support each other through the challenges they face, and Catherine begins to see the good in Hareton, despite his rough exterior. Chapter 22 The Escape of Catherine Linton The next day, Kathy made an attempt to escape from Wuthering Heights, accompanied by Nellie. They set out early in the morning, hoping to reach Thrush Cross Grange before anyone could stop them. However, they were intercepted by Hareton and Heathcliff, who had been out searching for them. Despite their pleas, the two men refused to let them go. Kathy was distraught and begged Heathcliff to let her go. However, he was determined to keep her at Wuthering Heights hoping to force her to marry his son Linton and secure his own position. He also revealed to Kathy that Linton was extremely ill and that he needed her to look after him. Despite her reluctance, Kathy agreed to go back to the Heights, hoping to help Linton. When they arrived, she found Linton in a turbul state, barely able to speak or move. She quickly set about caring for him, but found that he was difficult to please and constantly complaining. As time passed, Kathy became more and more disillusioned with Linton and his father. She saw that Heathcliff was manipulating Linton for his own ends, and that he cared nothing for his son's well-being. She also became aware of the cruel treatment of Herdon at the hands of Heathcliff, and felt increasingly guilty for her role in the family's troubles. One day, while out walking, Kathy met Herdon by chance. She saw that he was reading a book, and was amazed that he could read at all. Given the way he had been treated by his father, they struck up a conversation, and Kathy found that she enjoyed talking to Hareton, despite their initial awkwardness. As time passed, Kathy and Hareton began to spend more time together, reading books and talking about their lives. Kathy found that she had a lot in common with Hareton, and that he was not the brutish person she had thought him to be. She also saw that he was deeply unhappy and frustrated and longed to escape from the confines of Wuthering Heights. One day, Kathy decided to help Hareton escape. She knew that they would need help, and so she went to see Nellie, hoping to enlist her aid. Nellie was reluctant at first, but Kathy managed to persuade her to help. Together, they came up with a plan to get Hareton away from the Heights. Late one night, they made their move. Kathy distracted Heathcliff while Nellie and Hareton slipped away into the night. There and across the moors, towards the safety of Thrush Cross Grange. When they arrived, they were exhausted but elated. They knew that they had to keep their presence there a secret, for fear that Heathcliff would come looking for them. Over time, Kathy and Hareton grew closer, 
and fell in love. They knew that they would face opposition from Heathcliff and the rest of the family, but they were determined to be together. They found solace in each other's company and in the beauty of the moors around them. In the end, they were able to make a life for themselves, free from the constraints of Wuthering Heights. They knew that the past would always be with them, but they also knew that they could overcome it with love and determination. And so they lived, surrounded by the beauty of the moors and by the knowledge that they had found each other. Chapter 23 The Search for Catherine Linton It had been two weeks since Catherine's disappearance, and the search for her had turned up nothing. Everyone was becoming increasingly worried, and the moors were being scoured for any sign of horror. Heathcliff had been hit particularly hard by Catherine's disappearance. He had been acting strangely since her disappearance and had become increasingly reclusive. He refused to eat or sleep and spent most of his time wandering the moors. Nellie Dean worried for his sanity, as did everyone else at Wuthering Heights. It was during one of these wanderings that Heathcliff encountered Hareton and Joseph. The two had been out searching for Catherine and had come across Heathcliff on the moors. Hareton tried to convince Heathcliff to return home, but he refused, insisting that he would find Catherine himself. Joseph tried to reason with him, but Heathcliff would not listen. Meanwhile, Edgar Linton had been growing increasingly worried about his daughter's disappearance. He had been sending out search parties and offering rewards, but so far there had been no luck. Isabella had returned to the Grange to assist with the search and had been staying there ever since. One day, while out searching, Hareton and Joseph came across a woman who they initially thought was Catherine. But as they approached her, they realized that it was Isabella. She had been wandering the moors in a daze, having been driven to madness by Heathcliff's abuse. They brought her back to the Grange, where Edgar was horrified at her condition. Despite the setback, the search for Catherine continued. Nellie Dean had been out searching with a group of men, and it was during one of these searches that they came across a small cottage on the moors. The door was locked but they could hear someone inside. They called out, and to their surprise, they heard Catherine's voice in reply. They managed to break down the door and found Catherine lying in bed, weak and feverish. She had been living in the cottage with Hareton for the past few weeks, having fled Wuthering Heights in an attempt to escape Heathcliff's abuse. Nellie and the others brought Catherine back to the Grange, where she was reunited with her father. Edgar was overjoyed to have his daughter back and vowed to keep her safe from Heathcliff. But when he received a letter from Heathcliff demanding that Catherine be returned to Wuthering Heights, Edgar knew that he was in trouble. Heathcliff arrived at the Grange a few days later, demanding that Catherine be returned to him. Edgar refused, and the two got into a heated argument. It was only when Catherine intervened that the argument stopped. She begged Edgar to let her go insisting that she loved Heathcliff and that they belonged together. Edgar was heartbroken, but eventually relented. Catherine left the Grange with Heathcliff, leaving behind her father and everything she had ever known. Isabella was left behind, still recovering from her ordeal, and Nellie Dean was left to ponder the strange and tragic events that had led up to this moment. Chapter 24 The Return of Catherine Linton after Catherine Linton's escape from Wuthering Heights, there was a period of great uncertainty. Edgar Linton was beside himself with worry, for he knew that his daughter was in great danger. He feared that Heathcliff would come after her, seeking revenge for all the wrongs that he believed had been done to him. Nellie Dean, who had been with Catherine during her escape, was equally worried. She had never seen Catherine so frightened before and she knew that the girl was still in shock from her ordeal. But even as they worried and fretted, Catherine Linton returned to Thresh Cross Grange, safe and sound. She had managed to make her way back to the house on her own, and she had arrived late at night, exhausted and bedraggled. Edgar was overjoyed to see his daughter again, and he welcomed her back with open arms. He held her tight, weeping tears of relief, and he promised never to let her out of his sight again. But even as Edgar celebrated Catherine's return, there was a sense of an ease in the air. 
They all knew that Heathcliff was still out there, somewhere, and that he was more dangerous than ever before. And so they began to take precautions. The doors and windows of Fresh Cross Grange were locked tight, and guards were posted at every entrance. They waited, tense and anxious, for any sign of Heathcliff's return. But day after day passed, and there was no sign of the man they feared so greatly. Catherine recovered from her ordeal, and she resumed her life at Thresh Cross Grange as though nothing had happened. And yet, even as Catherine went about her daily routine, there was a sense of change in the air. She had seen the world outside of Fresh Cross Grange, and she had come to understand that there was more to life than the sheltered existence she had led up until that point. She spent long hours walking in the gardens, lost in thought. She thought about Heathcliff, and about the passionate, tumultuous love that had once existed between them. She thought about her father, and about the love and protection that he had always offered her. And in the end, Catherine came to a decision. She would leave Thresh Cross Grange, and she would seek out Heathcliff. She knew that it was a dangerous decision, but she also knew that it was the only way she could truly be happy. And so she left, leaving behind the safety and security of her father's house. She walked out into the world, her heart filled with both fear and hope. It was a long and difficult journey, but in the end, Catherine found what she was looking for. She found Heathcliff living alone in his old house at Wuthering Heights. At first, Heathcliff was angry with Catherine. He accused her of abandoning him, of betraying the love they had once shared. But as they talked, he began to see that Catherine was not the same girl he had known before. She was older, wiser, and more independent than ever before. And so, in the end, Heathcliff welcomed Catherine back into his life. They lived together at Wuthering Heights their love as passionate and tumultuous as ever before. And yet, even as they found happiness together, there was a sense of unease in the air. They both knew that their love was dangerous, that it could lead to nothing but pain and suffering. But still they held on to it, fiercely and passionately, unable to let go. For in the end, they knew that it was better to love and lose than never to have loved. Chapter 25, The Death of Hindley and Shaw In the aftermath of Catherine's death, Hindley's health rapidly deteriorated. He had been drinking heavily and was in po physical condition. Upon hearing of his sister's passing, Hindley fell into a state of despair and became increasingly reclusive, spending his days alone in his room. Meanwhile, Heathcliff had returned to Wuthering Heights and taken over as the master of the house. He had acquired a considerable amount of wealth and used it to buy up neighboring properties, expanding his land holdings. Hindley, in his weakened state, was powerless to stop him. One day, Nellie discovered that Hindley had gambled away the entire estate to Heathcliff. Heathcliff had taken advantage of Hindley's addiction to alcohol and gambling to gain control of everything he owned. Nellie was appalled by this turn of events, but knew there was nothing she could do to stop Heathcliff. As the weeks went by, Hindley's condition worsened. He became delirious and often rambled on about his sister Catherine. Nellie did her best to care for him, but it was clear that he was beyond help. One stormy night, Hindley passed away, leaving behind a young son named Hareton. Heathcliff now had complete control over Wuthering Heights and the surrounding lands. He treated Hareton poorly and forbade him from receiving an education or learning any skills. Hareton was relegated to a life of servitude, working as a laborer on the estate. Despite Heathcliff's cruelty towards him, Hareton showed remarkable resilience and perseverance. He secretly taught himself how to read and write and slowly began to rebel against Heathcliff's tyranny. It was clear that Hareton had inherited his father's stubbornness and spirit. In the years that followed, Hareton grew into a strong and capable young man. He and Catherine, Heathcliff's daughter, grew close and fell in love. Together, they plotted to overthrow Heathcliff and claim their rightful inheritance. The death of Hindley marked a turning point in the story of Wuthering Heights. With his passing, Heathcliff had gained complete control over the estate, but he had also sown the seeds of his own destruction. Hareton and Catherine, with their determination and strength, would prove to be worthy successors to the legacy of their ancestors. 
Chapter 26 The Marriage of Herr de Nernschall It was a bright and cheerful morning when Herr de Nernschall and young Catherine tied the knot in the little chapel of Gimmerben. The ceremony was a simple one, but there was an air of happiness and contentment that enveloped the small congregation. As they stepped out of the chapel, the sun was shining on the moors, and the birds were singing. Hareton had a spring in his step, and Catherine's face was radiant with joy. They made their way to the grange, where they were to be greeted with a hearty breakfast. As they sat down to eat, Hareton couldn't help but feel a sense of gratitude towards the Lintons. They had taken him in when he was an outcast, and they had given him the opportunity to make something of himself. He was now the master of Wuthering Heights, and he had a wife who loved him dearly. Catherine, on the other hand, was still in awe of the transformation that Hareton had undergone. He was no longer the rough and uncultured young man that she had first encountered. He had learned to read, and he had become well-spoken and refined. She was proud to be his wife, and she knew that they would be happy together. As the breakfast came to an end, they prepared to leave for their new home. They were to live at the Heights, and Catherine was excited to explore the house that would now be her own. As they walked towards their new home, Hareton couldn't help but feel a sense of sadness. He knew that his father would never have approved of his marriage to Catherine. But he also knew that his father had been wrong about many things and he was determined to prove him wrong about this too. When they arrived at the Heights, Catherine was overwhelmed by the size of the house. It was much bigger than she had imagined, and she knew that it would take them a long time to explore all its rooms. As they settled into their new home, Hareton showed Catherine the books that he had collected over the years. He was proud of his collection, and he wanted to share it with her. Catherine was surprised to find that Hareton's taste in literature was very different from her own. He preferred books about farming and practical skills, while she preferred the more romantic and sentimental stories. But she was happy to read whatever he gave her, and she was pleased to see how much he cared about his books. As the days passed, Hareton and Catherine settled into their new life together. They worked hard to make their home comfortable, and they took pleasure in each other's company. It wasn't always easy, of course. They had their disagreements, and they had to learn to compromise. But they were committed to each other, and they knew that they could overcome any obstacle as long as they were together. And so, life at Wuthering Heights continued. The Moors remained wild and untamed. But the people who lived there had found happiness and contentment in each other's company. Hareton and Catherine had overcome the hardships of their past, and they looked forward to a bright and prosperous future together. Chapter 27 The Death of Joseph It was a bleak and wintry morning when Joseph drew his last breath. He had been ill for some time and his health had been deteriorating steadily. But even in death, he remained a stoic and austere figure. His passing was felt deeply by those who knew him. He had been a fixture of the Moors for as long as anyone could remember, and his absence left a void that could never be filled. As news of his death spread, people from all around came to pay their respects. They came to the fam house, where his body lay, to offer their condolences and to say goodbye to a man who had been a part of their lives for so long. Hareton and Catherine were among those who came to pay their respects. They had known Joseph for most of their lives, and they felt a sense of loss at his passing. As they stood by his bedside, they could see the marks of a life well lived on his face. His skin was weathered and creased and his hair was thin and white. But there was a dignity in his appearance that spoke of his inner strength. As they left the farmhouse, 
Hareton and Catherine were struck by the sense of emptiness that pervaded the moors. They knew that Joseph's passing marked the end of an era, and they felt a sense of responsibility to carry on his legacy. And so, they resolved to make the most of their time together. They knew that life on the moors was unpredictable and that death could come at any time. But they were determined to live their lives to the fullest and to make the most of every moment they had together. As they walked back to the heights, they talked about the future. They spoke of the changes that were coming to the moors, and they wondered how they would adapt. But they were determined to face whatever challenges lay ahead. They knew that they had each other, and they knew that they could overcome anything as long as they were together. And so, they settled back into their routine, working hard to keep the farm running smoothly. They spent their days tending to the animals, repairing the buildings, and enjoying each other's company. As the weeks turned into months, life at the heights began to feel normal again. The passing of Joseph had left a mark on them, but they had found a way to carry on. And so, they lived their lives, never forgetting the lessons that Joseph had taught them. They knew that he had lived a simple and honest life, and they resolved to do the same. As they looked out over the moors, they could see the changing seasons. The winter snows gave way to the spring rains and the moors began to bloom once more. And through it all, Hareton and Catherine stood together, facing whatever the future held, secure in the knowledge that they would face it together. Chapter 28 The Reunion of Catherine and Hareton The days passed slowly at Wuthering Heights, with little change in routine. Catherine and Hareton grew closer with each passing day and it was clear to all that they were deeply in love. Despite the years of enmity between their families, they had found happiness in each other's company. One evening, as they sat together on the grassy moorland, Catherine asked Hareton about his past. Hareton opened up to her, telling her about his childhood with his father Hindley and his mother Frances. He also told her about Heathcliff's cruelty towards him and his isolation from the world outside of Wuthering Heights. Catherine was moved by Hareton's story, and she felt a deep sympathy for him. She resolved to help him learn to read and write, just as her mother had once done for her. Catherine spent hours teaching Hareton the alphabet and the basics of reading and writing, and he made great progress under her guidance. As Catherine and Hareton spent more time together, they began to explore the vast library of books that had been neglected for years. Catherine introduced Hareton to her favorite poets and novelists, and they spent many happy hours reading and discussing literature. Hareton was amazed by Catherine's intelligence and her love of learning, and he realized that he had never met anyone like her before. One day, as they were walking on the moors, they stumbled upon a little girl who had wandered away from Thrush Cross Grange. The child was crying, and Catherine took her hand and comforted her while Hareton went to find the Grange's servants. They returned the child to her grateful parents, who thanked Catherine and Hareton for their kindness. As they walked back to Wuthering Heights, Catherine realized that she had finally found a sense of purpose in her life. She had helped Hareton to learn to read and write, and she had shown kindness to a lost child. She felt a sense of contentment that she had never known before. When they arrived back at Wuthering Heights, Catherine and Hareton were greeted by Joseph, who informed them that a gentleman was waiting to see Catherine. The man turned out to be Edgar Linton, Catherine's father. He had come to take her back to Thrush Cross Grange, and he was shocked to see her in the company of Hareton. Catherine explained to her father that she loved Hareton and that they were planning to marry. Edgar was initially opposed to the idea, but Catherine managed to persuade him that Hareton was a good man and that she was happy with him. Eventually, Edgar relented, and he gave his blessing to their union. The next day, Catherine and Hareton were married in the chapel at Wuthering Heights. It was a small ceremony, attended only by a few close friends and family members. After the wedding, they returned to Thrush Cross Grange, 
where they began a new life together. In the years that followed, Catherine and Hareton lived happily together with a sense of contentment that they had never known before. They had children of their own, and they taught them to love and appreciate the beauty of literature and the natural world around them. The bitterness and hatred that had once consumed Wuthering Heights and Thrush Cross Grange were replaced by a sense of love and harmony, and the memory of the past began to fade away. Chapter 29 The Death of Heathcliff It was a dark and stormy night when Heathcliff passed away. The wind howled through the trees, and the rain beat against the windows of Wuthering Heights. As his life slipped away, the old house seemed to groan and creak in sympathy. Nellie Dean, who had been at his bedside during his final hours, was filled with a sense of sadness and relief. Sadness for the passing of a once vibrant man, and relief that his tortured soul was finally at rest. She had seen the toll that his obsession with Catherine had taken on him, and now she could finally see the peace on his face. The news of Heathcliff's death quickly spread through the surrounding villages and people came from miles around to pay their respects. Even the reclusive inhabitants of Thrush Cross Grange, who had long been estranged from the moody and unpredictable Heathcliff, felt compelled to attend his funeral. Despite his many faults, Heathcliff had left an indelible mark on the lives of those around him. His fierce passion and unwavering loyalty, though often misguided, had commanded both respect and fear. Even as he was lowered into the ground, it was clear that he would not be easily forgotten. As the days passed, life at Wuthering Heights began to return to some semblance of normalcy. Hareton and Kathy, who had weathered so much together, were now free to pursue their relationship without Heathcliff's disapproval. Nellie Dean, who had served as a witness to so much of the family's drama, could finally take a breath and reflect on all that had happened. But the memory of Heathcliff lingered on. Some whispered that they had seen his ghost walking the moors, and others claimed that they heard his voice in the wind. Even those who had once despised him could not deny the power of his presence and the legacy that he left behind. In the end, it was clear that Heathcliff was more than just a man. He was a force of nature, a living embodiment of the wild and untamed landscape that surrounded him. His passion, his pain, and his ultimate redemption were all woven into the fabric of the moors themselves. As the years passed and the seasons changed, the memory of Heathcliff slowly faded. The old house at Wuthering Heights fell into disrepair, and the once vibrant inhabitants were laid to rest in the cemetery beside it. But the spirit of Heathcliff remained, a reminder of a time and a place that had been both beautiful and terrible. And though his body was gone, his memory lived on a testament to the power of love, loss, and redemption. Chapter 30 The Funeral of Heathcliff The day of Heathcliff's funeral had arrived, and the whole of the neighborhood was gathered to pay their last respects. The somber mood was enhanced by the cold, bleak weather, as snowflakes fell upon the mourners as they made their way towards the church. Mr. Lockwood was among them observing the scene with a sense of melancholy. The coffin was carried to its resting place by Hareton and Joseph, while the rest of the mourners followed behind. Nellie Dean was also present, having returned to the heights for the occasion. She had come to pay her respects to the man who had been both her employer and friend, and who had played such a significant role in the lives of those around him. As they reached the churchyard, the mourners gathered around the open grave, the bleakness of the landscape was reflected in the solemnity of the occasion. The service began, and the voice of the clergyman echoed across the graveyard. The prayers were recited, and the mourners paid their last respects. Mr. Lockwood watched as the coffin was lowered into the ground, a final resting place for a man who had caused so much pain and suffering. After the service, the mourners made their way back to the heights. There, they were greeted by Hareton and Kathy, who had returned from their trip to Liverpool. Hareton had a somber expression on his face, while Kathy was visibly upset. The death of Heathcliff had affected her deeply, despite their turbulent history. As the mourners gathered in the drawing room, the conversation turned to Heathcliff's will. It was revealed that he had left everything to Hareton, 
including the ownership of Wuthering Heights and the surrounding lands. The news was met with mixed reactions, with some of the guests expressing surprise at the decision. As the evening wore on, the mood began to lighten, and the guests started to leave. Mr. Lockwood said his goodbyes and made his way back to Thrush Crossgrange, reflecting on the events of the day. He felt a sense of sadness at the passing of Heathcliff, but also a sense of closure. The funeral of Heathcliff marked the end of an era at Wuthering Heights. The man who had once ruled over the estate with an iron fist was now gone, leaving behind a legacy of pain and suffering. However, his death had also brought about a sense of peace and the hope of a better future for those who remained. As Mr. Lockwood sat by the fire at Thrush Cross Grange, he thought about the future. The estate of Wuthering Heights was now in the hands of Hareton, who had proven himself to be a kind and just master. He had the potential to create a better future for those around him, one that was free from the ghosts of the past. In the end, the funeral of Heathcliff marked not only the passing of a man, but also the passing of an era. The future was uncertain, but there was hope for a better tomorrow. The legacy of Heathcliff would live on, but it was up to those who remained to decide what that legacy would be. Chapter 31 The Visit of Mr. Lockwood As I sat in my chamber thrush cross grange, gazing out at the bleak landscape beyond, a sudden and urgent desire to visit Wuthering Heights overtook me. I longed to see the place once more before departing England for good, and so I resolved to make the journey. Upon my arrival, I was struck by the dismal state of the old manor. The windows were shattered, the doors hung on their hinges, and the once thriving garden lay in ruins. The only sign of life was the fierce barking of the dogs, who rushed out to meet me as I approached. I made my way inside, where I found the old housekeeper, Nellie Dean, sitting by the fire. She was pleased to see me and invited me to stay a while. I accepted her offer and settled in for the night. As we sat and talked, Nellie shared with me the latest news of the inhabitants of Wuthering Heights. She told me that Herdon Earnshaw had taken over the estate following Heathcliff's death, and that he and young Catherine were now betrothed. I was delighted to hear this news, for it was a happy ending to a tale that had been fraught with tragedy and heartache. Nellie also revealed to me a secret that had been kept hidden for many years. It seemed that Catherine Earnshaw and Heathcliff had a child, a son who was born shortly before Catherine's death. This child, named Linton Heathcliff, had been taken in by his uncle, Edgar Linton, and raised at Thrush Cross Grange. He had grown up to be a weak and sickly young man, and had ultimately died, leaving behind no heirs. I was saddened to hear this news for it seemed that the Earnshaw and Linton lines had come to an end. But Nellie assured me that Herdon and Catherine's union would ensure that the two families would be joined once more, and that their children would carry on the legacy of Wuthering Heights. As I prepared to leave Wuthering Heights, I felt a sense of sadness wash over me. This place, so full of memories and history, would soon be nothing more than a relic of the past. But as I looked out at the moors beyond, I knew that the spirit of Catherine and Heathcliff, and all those who had lived and loved at Wuthering Heights, would endure. And so, as I made my way back to Thrush Cross Grange, I felt a sense of peace and contentment. For though the people and places I had known were gone, their legacy would live on, carried forward by the generations to come. In the end, I realized that Wuthering Heights was not just a place, but a symbol of the human experience. It represented the highs and lows of life, the joys and sorrows, the love and hate. And though it may be gone, its lessons and its legacy would endure, etched forever in the memories of those who had known it. Chapter 32 The Return of Mr. Lockwood I had been away from the moors for over a year, but the memories of my time spent at Wuthering Heights and Thrush Cross Grange lingered on in my mind. As I approached the gate of Thrush Cross Grange, memories of the past flooded back into my mind. I found the estate just as I had left it, with the same melancholic beauty and haunting presence. Upon my arrival, I was met by a new servant, who informed me of the recent events at Wuthering Heights. The news of Heathcliff's death did not surprise me, 
but the details of his final days left me feeling uneasy. Apparently, he had grown more and more withdrawn and had been haunted by visions of Catherine's ghost. I couldn't help but feel a sense of sadness and longing for the past as I roamed the halls of Thrush Cross Grange. I was relieved to hear that Catherine and Herdon had found happiness together and that the dark legacy of Heathcliff had finally come to an end. As I sat alone in the library, I found myself drawn to a book that had been left open on a table. It was Catherine's diary, and I was unable to resist the temptation to read it. As I read through the pages, I felt as though I was reliving her life and experiencing her emotions. Through her writing, I was able to understand the depth of her love for Heathcliff and the pain that had consumed her after his death. It was then that I realized that despite the cruelty and violence that had taken place, the love that Catherine and Heathcliff shared was real and powerful. As I closed the diary and placed it back on the table, I felt a sense of closure. The story of Wuthering Heights had come to an end, and the characters that had haunted my memories for so long had finally found peace. In the days that followed, I explored the moors and visited the graves of Catherine, Heathcliff, and the other characters that had been a part of their story. I felt a sense of reverence and respect for their legacy, and I knew that their story would continue to live on in the memories of those who had known them. As I prepared to leave Thrush Cross Grange for the final time, I felt a sense of gratitude for the experiences that I had been a part of. The memories of Wuthering Heights would always hold a special place in my heart, and I knew that they would continue to inspire and captivate generations to come. In the end, I realized that the story of Wuthering Heights was not just about love and passion, but about the human experience as a whole. It was about the complexity of emotions and the power of the human spirit to overcome even the greatest of tragedies. As I rode away from the estate, I knew that the story of Wuthering Heights would always hold a special place in my heart and in the hearts of all who had been a part of it. Chapter 33 The Epilogue After the tumultuous events that have unfolded, the story of Wuthering Heights draws to a close with an epilogue that provides a glimpse into the future of the surviving characters. It is a bright, sunny day when Mr. Lockwood returns to the area where Wuthering Heights and Thrush Cross Grange are located, some years after the death of Heathcliff. He meets a young man on the moors, who introduces himself as Heathcliff's son, Linton. Linton tells Mr. Lockwood about his mother, Isabella, who had fled from Heathcliff's cruelty to London, where she gave birth to him before succumbing to consumption. He then tells Mr. Lockwood about his own life with Heathcliff, which was one of constant torment and mistreatment. Linton then reveals that his father had died, leaving behind a vast fortune that he had been unable to claim due to his status as an illegitimate child. However, before his death, Heathcliff had taken measures to ensure that Linton would receive his rightful inheritance, and the young man has now come to claim it. Mr. Lockwood is surprised to learn that Heathcliff had a son, but also feels a sense of relief that the cycle of cruelty and revenge that had consumed the older generation has finally come to an end. He notes that the moors seem quieter now and that the atmosphere is no longer charged with the same dark energy that had surrounded Heathcliff. As Linton prepares to depart, Mr. Lockwood reflects on the legacy of Wuthering Heights and the tragic fates of its inhabitants. He wonders if there was ever any hope for a happy ending to their stories, or if the characters were simply destined to suffer due to the dark passions that consumed them. Despite the bleakness of the story, however, there is a sense of closure in the epilogue. The surviving characters have found some measure of peace, and the next generation has the opportunity to forge a different path. The final image of the book is one of hope. As Mr. Lockwood watches Linton disappear into the distance, a new beginning stretching out before him. In the end, Wuthering Heights is a tale of love and loss, revenge and redemption, and the powerful forces that drive human behavior. Through her vivid characters and haunting prose, Emily Bronte has crafted a timeless masterpiece that continues to captivate readers to this day. Chapter 34 The Epilogue After the tumultuous events that have taken place, 
a sense of calm and closure finally settles over the windswept moors of Yorkshire. The narrative voice shifts once again, this time to a visitor to the area who comes across the graves of the Earnshaws and the Lintons. The visitor recognizes the names from a previous encounter with a stranger who claimed to have a connection to the families. The stranger was none other than Heathcliff's son, Linton, who had journeyed to London seeking to escape his father's control. Linton's brief and tragic life ended in a pauper's grave, a testament to the ways in which Heathcliff's obsession with revenge and control ultimately destroyed those around him. But the visitor's thoughts quickly turned to the surviving members of the families, particularly Hareton Earnshaw and Catherine Linton, who have found solace in one another's company. The two have grown close over the years, bonded by their shared experiences and their shared love for the wild, windswept landscape that surrounds them. Despite the hardships they have faced, Hareton and Catherine are determined to build a life together, free from the bitterness and violence that marked their parents' lives. As the visitor reflects on this, it becomes clear that the legacy of Heathcliff and his actions will continue to impact the families for generations to come. But even as the scars of the past linger, there is hope for a brighter future. The epilogue serves as a reminder that while the events of the novel may have concluded, the impact of those events will endure for years to come. It is a fitting end to a story that explores the destructive power of obsession and revenge, while also celebrating the resilience of the human spirit in the face of adversity. As the visitor turns to leave the gravesite, a final thought occurs to them that the wild and untamed moors will continue to endure long after the people who once roamed them have passed into memory. It is a poignant reminder of the fleeting nature of human life and of the enduring power of the natural world that surrounds us. In this final chapter, Emily Bronte leaves her readers with a sense of closure and hope, even as she acknowledges the lingering impact of the events that have unfolded. It is a fitting end to a novel that continues to captivate and inspire readers more than a century and a half after it was first published. Thank you for listening to Mini at Your Masterpiece. Don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel for more awesome content.